So we start, is it okay? Maybe you were a little bit astonished about this um, part of our working group, especially if we meet here in the context of the Christmas conference. It makes in a certain way no sense to talk about anthroposophy in the time of National Socialism if we want to focus on the Christmas conference impulses. And as I said in my opening lecture, when I came here, this mood of this Christmas conference was all the time positive. And Steiner said, we won't focus, we won't even pay attention during this conference on the forces of destruction. And it reminds me always to this common, very common gesture of Michael. We have here a lot of these uh, sculptures about St. Michael fighting with a dragon and one typical sign of the old uh, sculptures is that Michael is not looking to the dragon. He is, his gaze is to the future and he keeps the dragon down. Because, and this is what we all see and also seen, have seen in the past, if we focus on evil, if we concentrate on evil, we are in a little way in the seduction to get banned by evil. There are also in anthroposophy people who are experts, experts for evil forces. And in a way it's a cosmos of evil. Once in Germany was published, uh, was published a book about uh, the world power of Ariman. And uh, Ariman's Weltmacht was the German title. I always remember a conversation with Emanuel Seilmanns of Emichhoven, uh, the biographer of Ito Wegmann, when this book was published, he said, what a tremendous error to publish such a book from an anthroposophical side. We are responsible to integrate the knowledge of evil in all what we do, but never bringing on the cover and not only focusing on Arima. So in the Christmas conference, we see there is a focus orientation, resurrection forces. And I designed a little bit um, on um, Friday morning, if I'm right in the time uh, um, recapitulation, um, that it is the background of the Christmas conference is a year of destruction, starting with the ruin of the Goethe Arnum and the whole year 23 was incredibly difficult. But when Steiner decided to do the conference and to open the gate for the future and to order the society and its high school anew, he was almost only speaking about positive perspectives. And I said, um, on Friday morning, there is one exception. And this was in the closing day of the Christmas conference, which was the 1st of January 1924, when he said in a sentence, if you look out into the world today, you will see that for years now, there has been an extraordinary amount of destructive substance. Forces are at work that foreshadow the abysses into which Western civilization is still heading. And in, German, in the German language, it is a word Steiner never used before and never after. It is Vernichtungsstoff. So what is translated into destructive substance. It sounds even more radical in German. And then he's a little bit going on um, with the theme saying that in the future time are also very difficult because not only because of technology, technology of destruction and arms and weapons and nuclear power, but also weakening of soul forces. And we heard today in the morning in the working group about the spiritual core, I would say, of Waldorf education in fostering soul forces. And this is really the aim of education in our days. It's not, this, this, not the content of geography and mathematics, but how to school the soul forces in handling mathematics. 
and geography and history. It is a kind, Steiner said, it's only a precondition what we talk about for what is evoked by our talks or by our teaching. This is a growing of the soul forces. They need kind of um, an impulse to grow. And now he's saying in this lecture at the ending of the Christmas conference, what we see now is that people um, go beyond death, over the threshold, with these weakened soul forces after this materialistic development. And then he's saying we are facing a very difficult time because those souls, they have enormous difficulties in the post-mortal life. Not at all the question of hell, but the question of how to reincarnate in the future with ideals, with a positive force of idealistic thinking, utopias. And he's saying if it's going on in this way with materialistic culture, then there will be a next generation coming. And he said without the virtue or the capacity to think and to judge and to come with moral intentions on the level of intelligence and has said we are facing more or less a new generation following instincts and emotions. And this will be opening the way of mankind to the subhuman sphere. The subhuman sphere. And I think it's good to keep it in mind, but not judging young people now and saying this is the generation following instincts, uh, instincts or emotions. If at all we could follow this in Trump and in others, adults in our times, so it's not the new generation. And some of them, I would say, it's just the opposite. Even if they don't read our books and don't come to our lectures in general, we can see enormous forces also in the younger generation. Sometimes I wonder where they are from. <laughs> and uh, also on the level of intelligence, on the level of thinking and judging. So it, I always think it is not easy to make then a kind of summary about the next generation out of such a lecture of Steiner, but I take it for very serious. Also because at this time, he said, then this is the reason why we need a school for spiritual science. In a way, we need a kind of a schooling path to foster these soul forces in the school for the children and, uh, and uh, yeah, those who undergo puberty and adolescence, but later on as well. The School for Spiritual Science main object or main intention is not new insights uh, in the master sphere, but uh, to save human beings or the humanity of human beings or to become a true human instead of to become, become a true initiate, if we think initiation means having clairvoyance. So Steiner never opened a school for clairvoyance. I mean, it can be a positive side effect, but the true intention is this getting a true human being, or as we call this in the, in the Yiddish language, Eastern Jewish language, ein wahrer Mensch, a Mensch. This was the, um, the top of the culmination of the uh, development was to get a human being, a Mensch. So we are human beings, but to get true human beings. So back to my theme, this is the only, I wouldn't say shadow about the Christmas conference, but there is an indication that Steiner knew absolutely that we are facing difficult times. I will talk about now a little bit longer about these difficult times in Germany in the 30s and 40s of the last century. And maybe it makes no sense because in a way we at the moment we have other situations and it is an old argument against historical science that we can say we need um, a science of the present and not of the past. But in a way we can school ourselves in working through the past for the present and the future and we can learn from the past 
not in saying um, those people at this time were all wrong or uh, we at the same time would have made it better. But it is a schooling path. History is a schooling path of mankind. And if we consider how many lectures of Dr. Steiner handled in the past, I mean cultural epochs or the development of natural science or the development of spiritual science, the development of philosophy, a lot of anthroposophical teaching is linked to history. But it's clear in a way because it is the background of our presence and we have to, as a psychiatrist or psychotherapist or biographic researcher or a doctor, I have to say, without knowing our own past, we don't know our presence and are innocent but also helpless in mastering the future. So it's very interesting to see how Antipasophists faced the totalitarianism in Middle Europe and in an extreme form in what was brought by the Germans or by the Hitler government. So, and this is a topic um, in the mass media in, in Europe still today and it is also linked to the discussions, the actual discussions about anthroposophy and racial questions. How did they behave in a time where the paradigm, the leading thought was this kind of selection, domination, racial thinking. So I, it is linked also to our actual discussions. And I want to start because it's not so well known, I hope under, under you it is well known, but in, in the public it's not well known that Steiner was one of the first warners, one of those people who anticipated this horrifying development in the 20th century in the sense of not only materialism but also social Darwinism and also eugenics and selective thinking and judging which form of life is worth to be lived. So the distinction between which form of human beings do we want to have here and which other ones should be eliminated and supported, supporting some traits and eliminating the other ones. So what the Nazis did was not only killing um, the Jewish folk but also gypsies and other groups but also supporting the Germans, the German family, so supporting the fertility so the wished population, it was, it, was, it was a policy of distinguishing between the wanted and the unwanted life. And it's very interesting historically that the first big conference about eugenics uh, was in London 1911 and the major scientists of Europe came about the new ideal of the state that we want to foster good genes and eliminate the defective ones. That means uh, prohibiting marriages or yeah, enabling conditions that those who shouldn't be there should be at least have no brothers and sisters or better to say children um, and the other ones should be more productive than they are. And not only on the level of existence, but also the fight against diseases. So it was a health program, a health society program. And Steiner, in a commentary, said in a lecture, if this is going on, we will have a huge destruction in culture and societies. The, the public was full of enthusiasm, eugenics, and social Darwinism, they were popular, they were state of the science. It was not a right-wing thing. It was more or less the top science at this time. And Steiner warned, gave warnings and said, you know, if it's going on like this, we will have what Anna Arendt later called then totalitarianism. 
in her description we see that she describes these regimes. She said we always had dictatorships and tyranny, but it is not the same than totalitarianism. This is a new style of handling politics, a new style of government. There is always behind an ideology which explains history and justifies all measures. A perfect ideology and linked with this ideology is a kind of a determination which are superior people and which is the internal or external enemy. So regimes of totalitarianism, they have this ideology and this distinction. And they all had in the 20th century these regimes as the Nazi regime an abolition of the difference between civil life and military life and private life and state life, public sphere and private sphere. These differences were destroyed and they all had a, an enormous bureaucratic drive. Uh, Hannah Arendt once called it the rule of the nobody. So just measures or administration. Who is behind? Who is guilty or better to say responsible? Who is my counterpart? It's all bureaucracy. Steiner said if these tendencies are going on with this image of man, an image where children and other people with handicaps, mental or as they say, soul handicaps, they shouldn't be there. So it's, it's ended up in euthanasia. If this is going on, Steiner said, it will be for the end of the middle of the 20th century that we have crimes never happened before in world history. So Steiner was fully aware because I also mentioned it because the German way after 1945 of self-apologizing was over two decades to say we had nothing to do with the regime of Hitler and it came out of the blue very sudden as a terrorist attack and they overtook the government and we never voted for them and so on. So they pretended to be totally innocent and all of the sudden. And Steiner was somebody who really followed the, the evolution of thinking, also political thinking, social thinking, scientific thinking. And he saw that there will be at the beginning of the 20th century or the first third, there will be, if it's going on in this way, a catastrophic union in between scientific or pseudo-scientific thinking and social Darwinism and the end result which something in this direction. And we talked in our working group sometimes about the so-called School for Spiritual Science. I mean it was placed in the middle of this time saying we need other schools of enabling people. Also enabling people in seeing these tendencies because this is a question of knowledge. We, we should, I mean we were all surprised by the COVID situation but some were more surprised than the other ones. In a way, in a way I mean surprised maybe by the medical aspect but not by the reactions of societies and states because this is a long trained program and uh, it had its strong prehistory and um, but most of us were not busy with this kind of how states train themselves in react to maybe catastrophic event which they provoke by their own way of economy, ecology, medical research, experimental research and there is a strong connection <coughs> in between the military research and possible negative events. 
So it belonged to the state program since three decades to react on a situation which may be provoked innocently or by accident or provoked. So back away from our recent past, Steiner was studying the traits of evolution and post this free school for spiritual science, independent, because in a way this is a major problem of our universities that they are always leading paradigmas. And Thomas S. Kuhn, wonderful historian of science in North America, in the United States of America, and others have shown that these paradigmas have a, an enormous influence, that new thinking and new perspective have a big struggle in being accepted in communities uh, which have another paradigm and a kind of a consensual paradigm. It was a very important book of Thomas F. Kuhn about scientific revolutions. And Steiner wanted to perform such a scientific revolution and I hope some of us will still try to do it, but um, this is an enormous struggle even if there are also very positive signs. So back to the situation of the forthcoming Nazi regime. I don't want to explain and I don't want to say that this Hitler phenomenon is only social Darwinism, anti-Semitism and materialism and selection. It is always, we have to, it is more. And we can study a lot about the history of anti-Semitism but having been in Auschwitz-Birkenau, we always feel, as Primo Levi said, we can study a lot of anti-Semitism, but it is, the end result is not Auschwitz-Birkenau. There is also something in between. So all I want to say is, I don't want to say this is, therefore we understand completely what this regime was. I only describe preconditions and there is a remaining mystery, but a, a dark mystery. I don't want to talk about demons and so on, but just saying I don't pretend to have the explanation. But I want to say that Steiner prepared a group of people, I mean the Anthroposophical Society, that they are facing difficult times. And then, some of you will know, um, extremely striking is now in a historical perspective that Steiner named several times the year 1923, 1933, 1935, 1937 as decisive years for the future. And once he said to the priests of the Christian community, but also Ita Wegmann was part of the audience, it was the so-called apocalyptic course in September 24, Steiner said in the year 1933, the so-called beast of the apocalypse will appear. And there is a possibility that life on earth will end. So a total collapse of the earth planet. Now very famous at the moment in German cinemas is the Oppenheimer yeah, film. Yeah. And the good thing about the film is, and B and other elements that we face again the situation that the nuclear war in the time of Hitler was very close. So Heisenberg and the German scientists, they were also close to the achievement of having this nuclear power. And we all know also now from a historical perspective the suicidal tendencies of Hitler better to destroy Germany or the world than the opposite, than to accept that we can't win the war. So I don't want to say that Steiner predicted a nuclear ending of the world's planet, but he said that in 33 there will be a decisive time coming, a decisive time where these forces of evil or of the abyss are present, but he also said, and other forces, or just the opposite. These are the teachings that of the so-called reappearance of the Christ in the ether world. 
not incarnated, not a second ep epiphany, but that this representative of mankind is coming closer to the perception of human beings. So Christ is coming, but not physically, but let's say the principle of humanity, but also evil. Or let's say, yeah. So, and I mention this because those people who are, were the leading personalities of anthroposophical medicine in 1933, or of anthroposophical education as the faculty of teacher of the Stuttgart Waldorf Schule, they knew about this prediction. I can't say that they all had them every day and every second in mind. But I just want to say, in a way, they were prepared. Prepared. Since long time, they were afraid that Hitler will get the power. Most of them. It is not well known that Hitler wrote, published his first article against Steiner in 1921. 1921. That means 12 years before Hitler became chancellor, be before he got the power. So in the lifetime of Steiner, Steiner was in the Netherlands and he, he saw the newspaper coming from Germany and it was about, formally it was about the Ger German foreign minister. And this foreign minister of Germany failed in a conference in London where again and again it was discussed the conditions of the Versailles Treaty, which were ne very negative for the Germans. They had to pay enormous sums of money, and in, in fact it was a destructive treaty. As destructive as, as the one the Germans did with the Russians a year before. It was Brest-Litovsk, when the German army won against the Russian army and the so-called Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was in a way to destroy Russia. And Rittelmeier talked to Steiner, Rittelmeier, the priest of the Christian community, and what do you think about Brest-Litovsk? And the Germans were proud of this fight against the Russian army and, and Steiner said, it is the horror. And Rittelmeier couldn't accept that at the moment by Steiner saw, but Steiner saw the development which will happen and he gave many lectures, probably you know about how Lenin came to the Soviet Union by the help of the German government as a self-destruction of Russia. It was supported. The revolution in 1917 was strongly supported by the German military government to weaken Russia, to destroy Russia, that then the East expansion of Germany will become possible. So the German army leadership, Ludendorff, he, and the, they really brought this. And still today, I think, so important and responsible for the destruction of Eastern Europe what the Nazi time and before, because it was before Hitler, this was First World War, and Steiner said it will create enormous destruction in East Europe. So the Germans were all complaining about Versailles, and still the right-wing parties do, but nobody is talking about Brest-Litovsk. I mean, the historians do, but it's not in the mass media. That the whole situation is co-created with the German policy. And one of these warning voices was Steiner. And Hitler saw this Steiner. And then he saw that now the Versailles Treaty was so negative and the German minister was not hard enough to, to fight for better conditions. And then Hitler wrote, and why not? Because he's more or less a hidden anthroposophist. Or Word by word, he said that this minister called Simons is an intimate friend of the Gnostic, an anthroposophist Steiner, follower of the threefolding 
of the social organism and what all these Jewish methods for the destruction of the normal mental constitution of mankind are called. 21, in March 21, Steiner and his Jewish methods for the destruction of the normal mental constitution of mankind by the threefoldness, threefolding of the social organism, state free schools, and, and so on. You know the threefolding conception. But you can see that in 21, Hitler and also other prominent leaders of the party, they were absolutely skeptical and critical. And the first Waldorf school was, was for them a scandal, a state free school with such ideas and so on. So the Waldorf teachers, they were informed. And the other ones, I don't know, as I said, to what extent they had it all in mind. And I have to say that this extremely skeptical, critical, negative attitude from the prominent Nazi leaders and thinkers against anthroposophy, this was till 45. So we studied all the reports in the archives about was this SS security forces. They had a kind of Geheimdienst. What is the English word for Geheimdienst? Secret service. Secret service. It was called the SD of the SS. And they had a lot of reports of what anthroposophists do. I mean, at this time in Germany, only 7,000 members of the society were inscribed such a small little group, and most of them, as today, completely unpolitical, which is a tragedy, by the way. <laughs> but um, Anyway, so this was not a big party as the communists, but enormous reports of this security system, and the major sentences are always the same. It's totally incompatible this anthroposophy with National Socialism. Um, it is a danger for the state and a danger for education. This new humanity building of anthroposophy, it is a quote, must necessarily lead to the destruction of National Socialism, of nationalism, will lead to a dissolution of national ties and to racial mixing. So they wanted to have a national state with one ethic and ethnic group and anthroposophy will open the borders. Internationalism was a very negative word of the Nazis if you uh, if, if it's contributed to you, attributed to you, you are international minded, then you are lost. It is almost as negative as Jewish oh. in those times. It was. And um, so the reports are all the same. It is an enormous danger to the national socialist orientation. From that side, we would await that there will be no, more, no Waldorf schools in, in Germany and that they closed all anthroposophical institutions from the beginning. But in fact, this did not happen. And so now I come a little bit to the more complex aspects of these relationships. Um, they couldn't close directly in 33 the anthroposophical eight Waldorf schools existing at this time in Germany and um, the medical offices because they tried to pretend to be a legal, democratic voted government. So the first years of the Nazi government, they always said we are according to the laws. And Hitler always pretended to be a democratic person, democratically voted. I mean, we know the same story from other presidents. And uh, so um, 
So they, according to the laws, so they couldn't close the Waldorf school because it is one of the many private schools <coughs> in Germany at this time and could not be closed so easily. But they prepared, first of all, a law or a justified procedure to close the anthroposophical society, to forbid it. But it took them more or less two and a half years to prepare the arguments and the reason why it has, be, has to be closed. So the no anthroposophical society in Germany was forbidden in November 1935, two and a half years after the seizure of the power by Hitler. A very small society, as I mentioned, 7,000 members, it is not a big thing but well prepared by Himmler and Heydrich. Those who know a little bit about uh, the Nazi time, this uh, highest person. I mean, Himmler was, apart from Hitler, later on the leading politician. Um, and Heydrich was his right hand for all these SS things and for these uh, security uh, reasons. But not 100% of the government were promoting um, the closure of all anthroposophical activities. And this is an interesting historical study. That there were at least two very prominent politicians, Nazi leading persons, they wanted to keep the anthroposophical activities. One is very famous because of his criminal activity. Otto Ohlendorf, who was the leader of the Einsatzkommando Day in Ukraine and Soviet Union. The Einsatzkommando was an SS department. They were following the German army after the German army occupied the Ukraine and part of the southern part of Soviet Union. And what this smaller unit, I think only 100 people, this SS unit of Otto Ohlendorf, they killed the Jewish population and other groups where they said they are dangerous because now it's our country, Ukraine and Southern Soviet Union and we want to clean it. And this was, I mean, now we know more than 90,000 people were killed by this little group of the Einsatzkommando D in the leadership of Otto Ohlendorf, incredibly brutal. And also part of the history of Ukraine and Soviet Union was they did. But this same Otto Ohlendorf was a protector for keeping the Waldorf schools, keeping the Velida, and also keeping the biologic dynamic agriculture. This is a very complex story with Otto Ohlendorf. I don't want to uh, bring it now. He was an intellectual man had a PhD, was a kind of a thinker. His brother was anthroposophist, but this may not have been the leading thought for him. The main problem for Ohlendorf, he was a strong Nazi. He killed or let kill all these more than 90,000 innocents. But he said, I'm complaining about our Nazi regime because we are not productive enough. We are good in killing, but we are, where is the new science? Where is the new school where good Germans are brought up? Where is the agriculture with the healthy nutrition for our SS, for our army, for the true German population? And he saw and realized the Demeter products are very good. The Velada has good drugs. And the Waldorf School has enormous results. And in the Waldorf School, there was another prominent man, Alfred Bäumler, who was the philosopher of education in Berlin, the most prominent one. And he was a fan of Waldorf education without anthroposophy. And this was 
the important thing in these two cases that they say we want to have the results without anthroposophy. We want to keep the Waldorf schools, but they have, they have, they, they have to eliminate their anthroposophical teachers and teaching. And for Bäumler, he said the major problem is history in the teachings. Mathematics is okay, but how they teach history, this is not at all what we see as the true German history. So they have to change in their curriculum history, mainly. And all teachers who are inside, they should be at least loyal to the regime. But Eurythmy is perfect. And some other stuff, the practical orientation. I mean, one of the major enemies of the Nazi ideology was intellectualismus. And Bäumler often said, we talked so much about the problem of intellectuality, but we have no schools to support another development. And the Steiner created a type of a new school and that's what we need for our state. So Ohlendorf and Bäumler, the exponents of the supportive Nazi people, you can find them still today sometimes in the discussions, but maybe not in the United States or in Canada about anthroposophy and national socialism that such people were hidden anthroposophists. In fact, there were no anthroposophists at all, but they see there is quality. And they wanted to have the quality for their own Nazi Germany. So, now I'll switch the side, still have some minutes, and go to the anthroposophists. How did they saw the Nazi regime? I said they were warned by Steiner, anticipated to a certain extent. I want to name two people, exponents of a polarity. And the one on the lighter side was Ita Wegmann. She was absolutely clear from the beginning, from the onset of the Nazi regime, of the true signature of this regime. She was prepared in an extreme way. Ita Wegmann was always following up politics, and in 31, she thought Hitler will gain the power. It happened two years later. And she, she saw what will happen. And from the beginning, I could prove this with long letters, but this is maybe not our need now. Letters to England, to Dunlop, and to other friends, where she said in February, March 33, now it happened. Now Hitler is really there. And now we need agreements, very sudden agreements, how we save people, how we save life, how we organize, um, found organizations that those people who have to escape can come to Great Britain and other countries. We need organizations for refugees, for the Jewish one and the other political um, uh, persecuted people and so on. And she said to, we have to, we have to act now. And of course, it will, it, this will be the end of freedom and liberty in Germany, of all free thinking. They will close all our schools and the home places for the handicapped, so the curative education homes. And we have to be very fast now. As an international group of anthroposophists working together, and the last sentence of this long letter, published by me 17 years ago, from the literary estate of Ita Wegmann, how do we relate to those great things? And surely, she's writing to Mr. Dunlop in England, surely this is also one part of our tasks. Otherwise, anthroposophy has no meaning at all if we only acquire it for ourselves. In how do we achieve to order, to work in such a way that we can prevent perhaps many things by our attitude and by the right deeds? So we have to act now as anthroposophists, internationally. And Ita Wegmann in other letters was shocked that so many anthroposophists did not see the reality. 
and thought Hitler will be a temporarily problem or he is much milder than he says or maybe of benefit for Germany on the middle term. We call it now from a historical perspective the idealistic start of the regime. A lot of other Germans, B and Antipasophy, thought Hitler may be with his somewhat radical party a problem solver against the economical crisis and many other severe problems in at that time and so they they saw an idealistic outbreak Germany and values and and also a lot of antipathies she said in the letter that totally a, a total illusion an enormous seduction and it's interesting that Steiner said in 1933 if this culmination of this struggle will come in between Christ and the opposite, there will be an enormous seduction because those destructive forces pretend to be good ones. If the evil would be always in the SS dress, it would be easy to recognize, uh, but it's not so simple. So the envelope of evil in, in the good. So for Ita Wegmann it was clear. The polarity, if we talk about the Goetheanum, is Günther Wachsmut. He was a colleague of Ita Wegmann in the Executive Council. He was the treasurer and he believed, truly believed, this will be a good effect of this new regime. He believed it in 33 when they came to power. So he was in Denmark when the Nazis overtook the government and the Copenhagen big newspaper asked him. I mean, no news, big newspaper in, in Copenhagen would, would ask today uh, uh, members of the, the Council of the Goethe Annum what they think about a political... <laughs> um, but at this time, at this time we can say they were at least asked. And to a certain shock of many Danish antipacifists and other people, Waxmuth said that in general, this was not a shock, in general the Goethe Anum doesn't like to comment on politics. This is not the issue of the Goethe Anum. But then he said, in summary, antipacifists had been treated with the greatest consideration from the national movement in Germany. One looked from Dornach with sympathy on the contemporary events in Germany. The leaders of the new Germany will seize the problems in a brave and courageous way. Something good will surely come out of it. I mean, we can say he was not the only one in spring 1933, but Steiner's many teachings about, and a lot of historians, anthroposophical one think he only said it for the newspaper. But I don't think so. In the internal newspaper, at this time the Goethe Anum had an intern part for the members only. I mean the Goethe Anum newspaper was sold publicly, but there was an intern part for members only. And then there was also an article of Wachsmuth and he said that he would laugh that if the Pasifits shouldn't be so critical to this development in Germany now, they should take an active role in this transformation of Germany. And he called it a revolution. I mean, the Nazi called it also a revolution, but he too. And then he said, Goethe, at the moment of a great confusion around him, says the alert word, from here and today a new epoch of world history is going forth and you can say you were there. It is encouraging that those who want to be part of it also predominate in our ranks. So Goethe at the time of French Revolution and so a little bit later a new epoch of history and then Wachsmut is saying now the same and hopefully the majority in our 
membership is okay, we can say an error. Um, but in a way it had as a practical consequence. Because in a way Waxmut supported um, to work together with the regime. So, and for me Waxmut is not a bad person. I wanted to describe reactions. Waxmut was never a Nazi. He was an anthroposophist, but he saw the possibility that anthroposophical activities will be supported by the new regime. And then the impact of anthroposophy will grow and also f leading to a change of this German policy. And the first point was then agriculture, because indeed this was a main interest of Rudolf uh, of Hess, the successor of Hitler, and some other prominent Nazi leaders. And now they were formed a, a Reichsassociation of Agriculture, and Waxmut was in close contact to those farmers who had a nearness to the regime and sold the Demeter um, products as the one best for Germany. And it's interesting that they got a lot of visitors, especially in there was one farm, Bad Zaro, northern part of Germany. Uh, Monica will maybe know it, or some other who are familiar with the German geography. And Bad Zaro was the, the best farm in Germany for Demeter. And they invited all the politicians. And really high ranked politicians came to see Bad Zaro. And then there was a Waldorf teacher in Dresden, Elisabeth Klein, and she said, we must really show that we are the best school in Germany. And the Waldorf schools could become a model for a new type of German schools. And she was very gifted in going into dialogues with politicians. She was an extreme good teacher. And... Um, had a PhD about Novalis and could discuss Waldorf education from a philosophical point on a high level and was a very practical woman, four children and more or less the director of the big Dresden Waldorf school. And she was most successful in transforming the Waldorf school as a model of the state. I mean, it was in fact the only chance to keep it. Um, and it was kept till 41, was the last existing Waldorf school. Most of the Waldorf schools closed themselves in Germany. Now I come shortly to the Waldorf schools. And a little bit linked to the presentation of education today in the morning. Imagine you have such a Waldorf school. And imagine that then there is a political change. And what will you do? It is very difficult. A lot of people say it later they should close from the first day. Because in a way, <laughs> you can't start a Waldorf day with Heil Hitler. And other rituals of the Nazi. And they were implemented in all schools. So it was the end of a free school. And already in 1933, also the private schools, they could maintain only if they had no more Jewish teacher. So at least in Stuttgart, they had four. Some of you are well known in the United States of America, Ernst Leers, Friedrich Hiebel. and two others. And some of them emigrated later. So to keep those fear, and they were, they were listed at the government, um, to keep them would mean to close the school. So then started a long serial of compromises. To keep the school, that means to keep it without Schubert, who was the third one, who was leading the class for the handicapped. 
and uh, without Strakos, the engineer uh, brought into the school by Steino for technology. It's very interesting for those who don't know that Steiner said from the beginning we need a teaching of modern technology in the Waldorf school. We are part of our time. So he got an engineer of the railways, which was modern technology at this time, from Austria, an anthroposophist, and brought him into the school, Alexander Strakos. His wife was a very prominent scholar of Kandinsky, a very good painter. So Strakos were both quite prominent in Stuttgart, as Schubert with his and now, as a school, you have to say goodbye to Hebel, to Leers, to Strakos, and to Schubert, or to Close. So, after long discussions, they decided to detach and to find other schools for their beloved teachers. So, some of them went to The Hague in the Netherlands, or to Austria, and later on to the United States. So they took care of them. They didn't want to detach, but they decided to do. But some of the, of the teachers, as Colisco said, we should close. If we start to do such compromises, it will be the end of Waldorf education. Open the door for such measures, it's the end. But finally, the majority of the faculty said better to do this because what means closing? It means that all these little boys and girls are going to the state school and not only doing Heil Hitler in the morning, but also learning about races, Jews, this kind of penetration of ideology. I mean, the school was the space to protect development, humanity. And if we close it, so this hard problem that you have to go on to keep something and you have to do these compromises. Now they try to protect the school. First of all, a lot of teachers, they wrote to the government saying it is a true German school with Goethe and Schiller, and they try to say that anthroposophy is true Germany, and they all underlined the German factor. They knew inwardly that it's not a German school, even if the Goethe-Schiller culture was essential, but it's not a German school for Germans. So they brought papers to the government to read them today. It hurts us, because they really said this is true German education. But of course, 99% of these papers were had an intention. The situation was also very difficult in the school community because the school community are not only parents and are not only uh, the teachers and the children, but we know there are some parents. And parts of the parents were Nazis. About 10%, so we know it, a small minority, but very powerful. And they said, you risk the closure of our wonderful Waldorf school because you don't see that this is a good regime. And they try to overtake the parents' representation, those little group of Nazi parents. So. We had it on the corona discussions on another level, but we see we are not one community with the same opinion. In between us are different approaches. And this weakens, in a certain way, the strength, the force of such a community. So they try to become the leading fraction of the parents. They try to become um, as important as the teachers. At this time, the Waldorf School in Stuttgart and the other seven ones were led by the teachers. And now these parents said, we can't have a school led by the teachers because the teachers are politically wrong. So we need at least a representation of ourselves in the leading committee. And the Stuttgart teacher said, then we'll close the school before. 
So at the end result in Stuttgart, the Nazi fraction was too weak. But just to say it was also an internal struggle. Then Elizabeth Klein with her prominent course in Dresden was very successful. And the other Waldorf school thought maybe we should follow Elizabeth Klein. She has the same um, possibility as the farmers. A lot of politicians came to the Dresden Waldorf School visiting the lessons and seeing it's great. So the other schools decided, shall we follow Elizabeth Klein or not? To a certain point they said, no, we won't do. First of all, they admired her. She was very successful, but later on they decided too many compromises. And we don't want to have these this Nazi people in our, in our school as visitors. Visitors is a good theme, just two sentences. A lot of visitors came by the state, so the controllers of the schools. And this is interesting to read all the reports, because these controllers were all shocked by the reality of the Waldorf schools, because they just went on with their Waldorf school. Also in Dresden, Elizabeth Line only from the outer surface changed. Inwardly, there was no change. And it was still the same faculty with these anthroposophists. So Elizabeth Klein was also no Nazi. But she tried as far as she could to compromise from the outside. But the inner core of the Waldorf School was completely intact. And the, these visitors from the state, from the education ministry, they saw it. I mean, it begins when they came in, there was no Hitler image but Steiner. And then there was the morning poem instead of the Hitler poem. And then they went to the history lesson and it was still the same thing with the cultural epoch and the international orientation and no German history. And some of the reports are wonderful to read because they were full of aggressiveness that these schools still exist in, at a new state. No textbooks and no textbook with the Nazi ideology just going on. We can read it with humor today because in a way it's wonderful that they just went on with the Waldorf education but then it became more and more difficult with the measures, with the obligations. And as I mentioned, the most schools, they closed themselves. The Stuttgart school was closed from the outside in Stuttgart. And what they did was an enormous thing. They made a festival out of the closure. They collected, they brought all classes together, all parents and all of the one who were Waldorf's pupil in the past. So they invited all those who underwent the Waldorf school in Stuttgart to this festival event. I mean, they didn't call it a festival event. They said, the Schließung der Schule. But and now so interesting that they talked to the classes. All the teachers talked to their classes and there are transcripts of their speeches. <coughs> And it is so wonderful to see how they use the images of Waldorf education to explain the 10-year-old boy or the 14-year-old girl why this seed has to go now in the underground. Why it is needed, and they use images. They didn't talk about the Waldorf school because there were all other, also other visitors in the room. But all images out of the Grail story and other ones to show that there are impulses in the history which for a time has to go back or to collect their forces and to reappear then. And every teacher did it in another way. But it was very powerful. And also with the dramas they played and the music. So there are memories where the children say, I come totally upright from this very sad event. It was one of the strongest experiences of Waldorf education, the day of the closure. Sometimes we have, I mentioned this yesterday, when somebody died and we have the full image of a human being, 
and only thing on the graveyard. <clears throat> we miss the essential so often and discussed minor problems, but the real entity of this human being was brilliant. I would like to see him tomorrow. I would give all my money to have a chance to see him tomorrow. And I sometimes have the feeling that disclosure of the school, or let's say what they made out of it, was a brilliant star time of Waldorf education going into the underground. I mean, they went on privately. <laughs> this is the other story that they, as far as they could, they gave private lessons. I mean, they had to go to state schools, but of course the teachers kept the contact and so on. And especially, especially also to the Jewish children. There were a lot of Jewish children in the Waldorf schools and one of them said it was the only safe place for me, my school. The only safe place in this German country. And now the school was closed. So this, but they kept the relationship. And this was also in the Corona time so vital that so many teachers kept the relationship, even if the official lesson and the official school was closed, without comparing the situation, but similarities exist. So very powerful. I will maybe end now and then we have time for at least a um, conversation about, maybe also about Sigmund Rascher, if you want to discuss his story. He was at least the brother of Sigurd Rascher, the famous saxophonist who came to the United States, of a well known in the American society. And Sigmund Rascher was the most criminal doctor in Dachau with the human experiments. So out of a deep anthroposophical family, Sigmund Rascher grew up in the Waldorf School Stuttgart. Later on, he worked in the Glasshaus in Dornach. He was a member of the Anthroposophical Society. He did the most cruel experiments, human experiments in Dachau. This is in the public. He was an anthroposophist. Was he an anthroposophist? So Sigmund Rascher, and we could polarize him to Traute Lavrens page, um, 10 years younger than Sigmund Rascher, real anthroposophist, white rose resistance movement, so many other destinies in this time and maybe in the conversation a little bit more, but now ending with the Waldorf School part and with the lecture to um, um, two um, young people of the upper grade, they didn't want to accept disclosure of their beloved school. The one was the son of Herbert Hahn, and the other one was the daughter of Laurie Smits. So the daughter of the first Eurythmists and the son of one of the first teachers, well known, Herbert Hahn. So they said to the, to the faculty of teachers, we go to Berlin, we go to all ministers, we won't accept the closure of our school. And of course the teachers and the parents didn't want to go, this, they were 17 or 16 years old, going to Berlin. But they said we prepared a text from the whole class that we don't accept the closure of the school. So they went to Berlin. Brilliant young Germans, well dressed, um, and they were quite successful in coming to the ministries. I mean, they, m most of the, they, they ended in the last room, the four last room. So the chief secretary of the ministry. And they gave in their paper, but Bäumler they met personally. So this philosopher of education. And he discussed with them. And then he was so interested, he said, come home, we'll go on with the discussion tonight. So they saw Bäumler in his private house in Dahlem. And I mean, he loved Waldorf education, apart from anthroposophy. And after these long presentations, they presented their works and Eurythmy and they were brilliant, both young people, brilliant. And he realized we need such an education. But then I said, I, I will pose a last question concerning your school. If there will be an order of Hitler, just an order of Hitler, which you cannot understand, but it's an order of Adolf Hitler, will you follow? without understanding why Hitler decided to give this order or not. And they both said directly, absolutely not, never. 
And then he was so aggressive and said, go out. And this is the reason why your school have to be closed and will be forever closed. More or less, he threw them out of the house. And they came out and told the story and said, no. A judgment or an order which we can't understand, we won't follow. I mean, later on, Gotthard Hahn became one of the teachers of the reopened Waldorf School, and there was a strong development after 1945, beginning with Stuttgart. So this Waldorf School really went in the underground, and they had this uprightness also to say no in this personal confrontation. So Christmas conference, I think those two young people in Berlin, Steiner would have loved it. This confrontation <coughs> going into the home place of the ministers and representing. Bäumler wanted to have his child after the war in the Waldorf School in Dresden, uh, in Reutlingen, but they did not accept the child. Elisabeth Klein was never accepted again in the, in the group of the Waldorf teachers. For a long time she was banned. So this is the time after war and also the difficult working through about the behavior. Yeah, I don't want to um, shorten it or to bring it on a, now in a resume, but I think it brought us into a reality of the 20th century and of the 21st century. <laughs> that we may keep anthroposophy, our perspectives, our values, our thoughts, our insights, or our attitudes, and then we come into historical or present situations. And there is a lot of moral intuition needed to stand and to find creative solutions and um, when the Waldorf School in Stuttgart was also forced to say Heil Hitler, in the morning one pupil said to the teacher, how should I do it? And the teacher said, you know, he is so ill. Say Heil Hitler, inwardly. So they had a lot of side paths. Um, <laughs> creative solutions to a certain extent, uh, to a certain limit. And then they decided, or in this case, the other one decided, but some other Waldorf school, the first was in Hamburg, they closed themselves saying, but as I said, they had to give the pupils to the state schools. So no pure, not that the true good is, has to be done, or how to, how to go on. And therefore, I think it is belonging to the Christmas conference and to the impulse of representing anthroposophy under historical uh, situations. And it's not so easy now to say, uh, or it's easy to say now from the retrospective, what, uh, what had to be done. And uh, also to be astonished about Günther Wachs' mood, which is sensible to be astonished, uh, and to be with Ita Wegmann clear, but we see the practical problem with an existing institution in a given state and society. Yes, maybe this as a contribution to, to the working group today. 20 minutes are resting, and we can now open total the conversation, not only about the Waldorf School, about anthroposophy and national socialism, about the behavior, about Steiner, whatever you want to, to bring. And as always, I also like if somebody, if we share what we experienced in listening, because uh, this is also a story who touches our heart. Some of, of you know about German history or know people who suffered or even died. But even if we have no personal connection, this is going very deep in our, I think, incarnation situation. So it's also interesting or moving to hear for me and for the other ones 
thoughts in listening, associations, personal memories, or, but it can also be objective questions, historical or present. So thank you, as, uh, first of all, thank you for... <laughs> thank you.